Welcome, everyone, and welcome to EBBF, Ethical Business Building the Future. The theme of today's session is how to do good and stick to your values while helping your organization make a profit. Some people think that profit and values are incompatible, but I think today we will find out otherwise. Our guest facilitator today is Mark Rivers. He is a husband and father of three boys and also a successful chief financial officer. Previously with Roche Medical in Switzerland, four years ago, he moved his family to New Zealand and he became the chief financial officer of Fonterra, which is a global dairy nutrition company based in New Zealand. Thank you, Gene. <clears throat> Thank you, Gene. It's so nice to be with you all uh, today. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to the discussion um, about meaning and, and career and, uh, and exploring these, these, these different aspects. Um, uh, maybe I'll just um, start with uh, just some reflections on, on sort of so a couple of things that I've kind of learned along the way. Um, you know, first is, um, uh, as, as Gene mentioned, you know, I've had the privilege of, of working now almost um, you know, 25, 30 years in uh, a couple of different industries in, in lots of different geographies, um, you know, US, Europe, Asia, um, in the healthcare industry, uh, now in sort of nutrition and agriculture uh, and food. There are a couple of interesting themes that I've kind of realized kind of along the way. Um, one is, I guess, is around just the importance of finding purpose and meaning in, in what we do and kind of a realization that um, that purpose and meaning, the best way to think of it probably is almost like the, a concentric circles of, of meaning The maybe at the highest level um, is the ultimate purpose is, of course, somehow to ensure that what we're doing is in some way making the world a better place, right? That, that, uh, that tomorrow is somehow better than yesterday. And then al aligning the purpose and mission of your specific organization that you're a part of you know, somehow attaching it to that, you know, finding that. Be and what's interesting is when you um, articulate that, when we, when we are conscious about how that's linked to, to, to that hierarchy of, of purpose, um, it brings a huge amount of energy, you know. Um, it's amazing how much resilience you find in yourself when you can see that what you're doing is important and meaningful and um, and kind of linked up. You discover reservoirs of energy, I think, through that. And the opposite is also true, right? If you if you feel like what you're doing is meaningless, um, it's amazing how quickly you get drained and stressed out and uh, and the like. So I think it's really important to at all times be very conscious about uh, about that. You know, whether it's um, the the purpose of the organization or the department or the group that that you're a part of in that organization. You know, link up what your what your purpose and meaning is um, to all of that hierarchy, that uh, that set of concentric circles. You know, that's one really important lesson that um, that I've learned along the way. Another interesting lesson I've came across this concept, and some of you would have heard it as well, is this idea of uh, ikigai. Uh, I like the idea of, of circles. So. Um, and, and I use this framework a lot when we talk about career and we have career discussions with, with, with people. And the idea there is basically is um, draw first one circle, which is your skills. What are you good at? You know, and then the second circle is what is your passion? And then the third circle is what does the world need or your organization need? And then maybe there's a fourth circle, which is get paid for it. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but the first three are most important, I suppose. But the fourth one is a practical one. And of course, the overlap of those circles, uh, you know, is an indication of what your career should be. And recognizing that all those things are, are not static, they're changing. You know, your skills are changing as you collect more experiences, um, as you get more education. Um, the, uh, your passion might change, uh, but also what the world needs and what your organization needs might change as well. Uh, and so, uh, but that's a pretty good guide, I think, um, when we think about career and, um, and, and meaning and purpose. And maybe the last little area that, um, that I've, I didn't know at the beginning of my career that I've kind of started to, and I'm probably most interested in right now, is the realization that you know the workplace is a fantastic laboratory <laughs> to explore you know how what are the best conditions for a group of human beings to accomplish something together 
Yeah, just a fantastic laboratory to explore that. Um, you know, under sort of live conditions, right? Um, and uh, and I think there's sort of probably no end to uh, to discovery in that whole thing. And that's what I'm really find myself thinking a lot about right now. You know, is you know what are the uh, atmospheric conditions, the soil conditions, <laughs> um, you know, et, et cetera, that allows a group of human beings, you know, to fulfill their individual potential, but even more um, to fulfill the potential of the group. Um, again, to achieve that ultimate purpose, you know, whatever that might be, right? And I think that's just something that's just absolutely fascinating to, to think about and, and how that's evolved over time. You know, there was a time where um, one assumed that the best conditions were kind of this top-down power kind of structure. And of course, what we're realizing now is how limiting that is. In fact, then that, it, um, that the role of a leader, for example, is really about empowering, enabling, and removing obstacles and creating some of those conditions and that sort of thing. So, um, so I think that's very interesting is, um, you know, just to explore that, uh, you know, those are just some thoughts, reflections on, uh, on sort of 25 years in different uh, countries and, and different industries. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Uh, it, it would be good actually to ask back this question directly to the audience, right? Uh, uh, going back to what you are describing, what are the best conditions to create a meaningful workplace? What are the attributes needed for a positive atmosphere. I don't know if anyone wants to add anything on that, anything that they have experienced or. I think I'd like to share. This is um, something I wasn't I wasn't personally involved in, but it's been you know I'm an optical engineer, and uh, you know so this has been a pretty exciting uh, month for anybody involved in optics and astronomy with the launch of the, the the successful launch and deployment of the James Webb Telescope. You know this is a project you know 30 years running. Lots and lots of delays, cost overruns. One of the things that interested me the most wasn't related to the actual building, design, fabrication, deployment of the telescope, but was of the rocket that launched it. And so there's only a certain amount of propellant that could fit on the telescope itself. And you know, once it's separated from the second stage, you know, that fuel is set and locked for the lifetime of the telescope. And it was really interesting because it was anticipated that after launch, they would have a, a 10 year lifetime, which is a pretty short lifetime for something that costs $10 billion. But Arian Space, the engineers, the technicians that worked on the rocket, they were able to build the closest to the perfect rocket they could because they had defined a mission. What can we do to end up with more propellant left on the telescope by getting the rocket into the best trajectory possible using the minimal needing to use the minimal amount of propellant propellant to make adjustments to the trajectory by the telescope itself as it heads off you know to its distant orbit and so over years they would test the rocket engines and they say okay this one is just a little bit more efficient than this one so we're going to set this one aside this valve a little bit less stiction on it so we're going to set that one aside so when they built the rocket that this thing got launched on they put the best possible parts in with just fractions of a percent difference. And guess how long they extended the, the, the mission of James Webb Telescope by doing that? They doubled the life of the project through their efforts. You know, it was just that passion that they had to help this telescope get the most science out of it that you know, basically allowed that to happen. And it's just, it just was amazing to me when I read that story. Yeah, no, I think that's great. That's. Um what what emerges when you put a collection of of um of human beings together and it would be interesting to to see like the profile of that group of scientists or group of professionals you know what um how similar how different they were um what were some of the settings and conditions you know during times when they were consulting together um what were some of those dynamics that kind of led to to, to better outcomes right mm -hmm. um you know inevitably there's folks who prefer to be more quiet there are folks who prefer to be more talkative or um, more confident less confident all those sorts of things but what are some of those ways to you know very practically um, to help that team feel you know the purpose there is very clear they're very motivated about what they're doing um but um yeah what what, what do you think are there any I think uh, I think that there's something that is not mentioned very often when we talk about process, but the challenge strikes me as something that pushed them to do more than was expected. Um, mm -hmm. and, and just yesterday was seen in, in Barcelona all over the walls. There's a really tiny company which is sending out a message to all the CEOs of big supermarkets. Uh, and it's a startup food company, eco-sustainable. 
and and they want to challenge and send this uh, letter to the CEOs. And it's a challenge. Yeah? It's well beyond their scope. It's something that creates an emotion which is not normal. It's something that makes you think about what you're doing even when you go back at home at night. So that challenge, obviously a meaningful challenge ideally, can be maybe one of the factors that can move forward our, our, our group working, our leaving aside competition and working together and really bring out the best. I think another element must have been the clarity of the purpose. And, and the fact that probably there was not much to be disputed on this purpose, you know, mm. if somebody said, let's go for 20 years more, they said, okay, let's go. And then they obtain 10 years or whatever. The purpose was very clear. And the purpose was not uh, selfish. Purpose was for somebody else. I mean, for something else, mm. whatever they gained on their side uh, was a benefit for somebody else. So was one of those situations where there could only be winners and they perceived it as such. Uh, <clears throat> finally, it was also an open-ended an open-ended purpose. You could always go beyond, you could always do better. So this also was something that made them, if one day they arrived and they said, you know, we've made it nine years, there was nothing to tell them, okay, let's go for 10. So uh, lots of inspiration, I think, came from the elevated purpose that they set for themselves. The resources were made available to them. You know, most organizations, whether they're governmental or, or profit-making or nonprofit, most organizations have finite resources. What struck me, Mark Himmel, was when you were talking about the delays, the delays actually enhanced, greatly enhanced the project. Um, in most situations, you don't have that luxury. But Mark, I wanted to ask you, what are the components, in your view, in your experience, what are the components of a meaningful workplace, particularly in an organization that is profit-making and you're the financial guy, you do the numbers. Mm -hmm. And so for you, what are the, the elements of a meaningful working workplace? What makes that happen? Yeah, so I guess in my experience, I mean, one is, of course, on one level, um, profit is a is a goal, uh, I suppose. But um, uh, but I, what I found often is that that's sort of the it's it's more of an outcome and and not something that's extremely motivating for very long. <laughs> in other words, you have to really um, go much higher and much deeper. Uh, to what is uh, actually a, a real purpose, a real meaningful purpose of the whole organization. You know, so in the case of um, in the healthcare days, you know, where in the healthcare companies that I worked at, it's about saving lives and improving patients' lives. And, um, uh, you know, that's how, that's actually the goal and, and, and what you're trying to frame. And you're inspired and motivated by hearing patient stories and, and just staying focused on that's actually our mission. That's why we exist. And so long as we're doing that really well, then um, then yeah, society's going to reward us, um, and and that'll show up in in, in profit. Um, so that's on one aspect is you know the the mission of what we're trying to achieve. Um, that what is it that society is actually needing from us uh, to accomplish? You know that's I think extremely motivating. Um, the other side that is you know to profit is on the input side. You know one is the output of what you're what you're doing. The other is how much input do you need to get it done? And so that goes goes to things like efficiency and, and stuff like that. And I know that that seems less exciting to talk about. Uh, so from a finance guy, you know, often you're kind of re reminding folks about the importance of efficiency and everything. But um, but even there, um, I found it really useful to link even that back to meaning and purpose. You know, I think that being efficient is something that's extremely noble. In fact. There's a great deal of nobility in being, uh, you know, or the opposite is being wasteful is is not very noble at all, right? Where that conversation has gone uh, more recently with triple bottom line and uh, ESG discussion is wonderful because it's actually expanded our vision so much more than just a PL uh, or just a balance sheet. Now we're actually it's it's the same formulas that we're talking about, you know, of return on investment and uh, output and input, but but suddenly we can be much more holistic about defining what do we mean by output? What is, what is the, 
cumulative set of outputs that we're trying to deliver actually, you know, that the world actually needs. And let's be really broad and holistic in, in how we you know, talk about that. But equally, we have to be very broad and holistic about the inputs. You know, it's not just cost and time, but it's also natural capital. You know, it's all the forms of capital that, that go in there. And, um, and then we, we realize that we actually, we are creating value. We're making the world a better place uh, when the relationship between those holistically defined outputs, you know, are being achieved more efficiently tomorrow than yesterday. Um, including, you know, all of those holistically defined uh, inputs, right? Um, and so to me, I think that's really meaningful and powerful. And of course, um, a lot of it is about the communication and, you know, connecting to the individuals to see what motivates them. But um, yeah, just, those are some thoughts, Jean. Thank you, Mark. You are going back to the role of having a clear purpose uh, many times in, uh, in your conversation and whatever we have just said until now. I just wonder if, you feel as a top manager in your organization some sort of responsibility helping your employees to find that meaningful purpose i'm thinking about the young generation that join an organization they are not supported from an educational system to discover what's their purpose so they enter an organization sometimes very confused about what this purpose is for them do you feel any responsibility in helping them and this discovery? And if so, what do you actually do on your day-to-day -day mm -hmm. work uh, to support that? It is really important to always be very clear about what's the mission and, and the purpose and, and to be able to articulate that and things like that. What I've actually found with, with, with young folks you know, coming in is um, they've already thought a lot about a lot that, that a lot. By coming to your organization, their first question is, what actually is your purpose as an organization? And do I believe in that? You know, um, and which is fantastic because it kind of lifts everybody's game, right? You know, what really is our purpose? You know, I find that pretty thrilling, you know, and encouraging, you know, that this, the new generation coming in are pretty demanding, you know, about um, being, being responsible and things like that. And um, has that within, changed um, over time, Mark, when you interviewed uh, Yeah, people? I've that noticed really? that. I think that has changed. Let's say 25 years ago, um, you know, the, the, the goal of, of an individual might have been about just making a career and, um, you know, uh, moving up the hierarchy and the ladder and about, um, you know, making a certain amount of money and that sort of thing and almost not caring what. And now it's like that's way down the, the priority list. And um, it's really about believing in the mission is your organization doing something which is making the world a better place you know tell me the story you know what actually is it that we're that we're doing and that sort of thing so yeah so in the case of healthcare it has to be about um you know saving lives improving lives um you know that's that is got to be the purpose and uh in the case of um at fonterra you know it's really about uh nutrition finding the purpose and meaning in that and the purpose and meaning of a cooperative you know these these sorts of these sorts of things. Those are the attributes that are that I hear are really important. Yeah, I think it has changed. Uh, but I think I also belong to that generation that used to complain quite a lot to the comp uh, about the company culture, about my manager not doing enough to create that uh, positive working environment that we have been talking about. So my next question to you is: What is actually your expectation towards your team to help you? create this positive environment, right? Because I guess it's a, a joint responsibility. I think, I think it is. And um, I mean, I think the other thing that's really changed over that period is, again, this kind of power-based top-down sort of approach that was probably pretty typical, you know, 25 years ago uh, to that's really history now. I mean, you know, there's no way if that's the type of manager you are, there's no way you would ever be um, appointed now with those kind of attributes. Now it's really about collaborative and teamwork and um, you know how do you kind of create the conditions that to, to bring the you know the best out of the out of the team those are more the attributes that are really sought after I think now and I mean not that they're we're great at that I mean I think there's 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 so much we have to do to improve to make that uh, to become much much more you know thoughtful of and intentional about that but yeah no I think it's a pretty exciting time pretty encouraging really I think that at the conversation, you know, people are, are much more open-minded to that. Do, do you have a, a, a concrete example of conversation that you would have with your team exploring this concept of meaningful 
workspace or positive working environment. You know, there's conversation going on. We talk about culture, you know, um, again, which is exactly that conversation. You know, what is the atmosphere and conditions that, um, that you know, allow the full potential of, of people to emerge, right? Uh, one other practical thing that I found really useful is um, we, we have like a, a young leaders uh, kind of uh, group uh, that's, that's come together. Um, at one point, we call them the millennial group or whatever, but it's almost like a, a mirror of the leadership team, and we'll provide them with a similar agenda that we're dealing with, and um, uh, and then have them, you know, sort of chew on that and and play it back to us. You know, what do you think? Um, first of all, are those even the right things that we should be talking about? Um, but uh, but when we when you are talking about it, what what is your perspective? What's your view? So that kind of uh, that's been really interesting. Nan, would you like to ask Mark the question you wrote in the chat? I mean, for young people to join an organization, um, I think it's uh, it's clear that they are motivated and they they are excited about the vision and purpose um, for them to to perform in in this new organization. However, um, how long this passion or uh, might last? <laughs> how to actually encourage? Um, also, also retain um, people in an organization to continue to let them to have joy, walking, have purpose, to work in a long term. And that's a challenge, I think, in, in the pandemic mm. time, especially when people don't see each other very often and you work home alone. <laughs> yeah. um, and how actually you motivate people in, in such a situation to, to let them still having this joy and purpose to work together. You know, again, we were saying earlier about the importance of meaning and purpose, articulating that, and um, um, maybe one thing that's maybe not on the list that I would add um, is the importance of relationship. You know, I think we are human beings and we are social creatures, you know, and I think um, there's a huge energy that's created from having real, authentic, genuine connection with one another. When you combine that with a meaningful purpose and mission, you know, and uh, and this sense of progress and and learning and potential emerging and, and these sorts of things. My goodness, that's pretty magical. That's a pretty magical combination. <laughs> you know, and uh, again, you you can tap into kind of all kinds of reservoirs of energy um, uh, around that, right? You know, and compare that to another method. You know, from before, which was so much again, so much fear based before, right? I mean cracking the whip. And uh, if you don't do this, you know, you'll be punished. Or if you do do this, you'll be, you'll get this nice reward at the end and that sort of thing. But um, I, I think it's talk about sustainable, you know, peak performance over time. I think that's more the magic combination is, is meaningful purpose, um, a place where relationship is really formed and, um, and, and maintained authentic and real, um, you know, and this sense of progress and potential emerging. Beyond this uh, millennial team mirroring the board and conversations, what other spaces uh, have you created uh, in order that this type of conversation can happen and how did you create it? Look, I think, I think those spaces can be everywhere. I mean, um, at first it has to be um, you know, every one-on-one -on -one discussion. One, one practical thing I've advised is, you know, the importance of relationship is, is just so significant in any, you know, endeavor that a collection of human beings is doing. And one practical thing you can do is almost take a little inventory, list out the 10 relationships that, uh, 10 most important relationships that you have. And you can almost take an inventory of those. And, you know, on a, on a scale of one to 10, how what is the quality of that relationship? Now let's work on that. I'm going to take the worst ones and I'm going to improve those, you know? Uh, so an important space is just the one-on-one -on -one discussion, you know, that, that each interaction is a chance to, uh, to build that relationship and to, and to improve small group settings. Um, there's a space for larger groups, you know, so we, we have uh, leadership forums that meet periodically. So it, I think it is good to be intentional like, to create those, you know, kind of a, a wide array of things. But, you know, part of the human reality is we behave differently one-on-one -on -one than we do in a really large group. And so I think to be very conscious about how we set those up, again, that's, I think that's part of the idea around creating the atmosphere. Even the, the shape of the table matters, <laughs> you know, uh, or, or the power of in a large group to have, instead of everybody sitting theater style, but have 10 small, small circles and everybody sitting around a circle. And then, 
you can see the power, the energy in the room, you know, kind of going back and forth from the table to the plenary. And, you know, I think those are all things to be, that we have to learn to be um, more intentional around um, because it does have an effect. It has an impact on, on how that group of human beings is going to interact more effectively. Yet, uh, there's a really beautiful example, really practical example, I remember, of a meeting you created when you were back in Roche. One of the um, interesting moments for me was the, the first time that I had this group of, uh, of global financial leaders come together um, at, uh, at, at the previous company. And, um, and I really was thinking a lot about, you know, so what, what, do I, what do I say to this group of, you know, finance professionals, basically, you know, that uh, can be um, remotely inspiring. And um, what I ended up um, realizing, so after thinking about it, uh, was, um, you know, it's back to meaning and purpose, you know, and, and what is, you know, is there a noble purpose around finance? You know, finance has such a terrible reputation, right? <laughs> of, of my gosh, these money grubbing, you know, evil, you know, whatever, these kinds of things, uh, you know, which of course is deeply unfair. What, what is, you know, is there a noble purpose of a function like finance? And to me, um, it was just being able to articulate that, you know, and kind of link that to these kinds of heroes and stuff. Because um, for me, the noble purpose of finance is it's about uh, finding truth, really, right? It's about making things really clear and transparent and um, holding up a really uh, finely polished mirror to uh, the organization and everything about what has happened, what, what really happened. Um, and what could happen in the future, right? So it's about making things very clear and transparent to help make better decisions, ultimately. You know, that's, that's really what the purpose of it is. Uh, I mean, there's lots of other things, of course, but that's sort of the, uh, the thing to me that's the, the inspiring mission of it all, right? That where, where it fits in. Um, and, um, you know, and just to, to look for examples of, of, uh, of, you know, similar sort of things, you know, and just realize that actually you can take some pride in your profession, you know, and there is really a nobility and being really excellent uh, in your profession, you know, and in my case, it's finance, but it's, um, you know, whatever that profession might be. I think you are a living example of uh, creating meaningful experiences while making profits. Uh, and I wonder if you ever found any or encountered any resistance in this journey, if you ever felt lonely within your organization. Yeah, lonely. I mean, I think it is important to, um, um, you know, as a practical matter, you know, to find allies, uh, you know, in your in whatever group that you're that you're in. And I think you do have to kind of um, meet people where they're at uh, as well and recognize that, you know, we're all on a journey, you know, of understanding these things, you know, in no way do I understand these things um, well enough at all and that sort of thing. So, so I think we're all just trying to, you know, be, again, be better tomorrow than we were yesterday. Uh, I've never had any problem finding allies, um, you know, and, uh, um, and creating those kind of relationships and just kind of have a little nucleus of, 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 uh, of thinking like that and then sort of let it expand kind of organically and naturally from that. But people do respond to that sort of conversation about nobility and purpose, I find. Um, profit, profit takes care of itself. You know, if, if you're doing all those things, you've got to kind of, you know, if, if, if what you're doing is really useful and, and valuable for the world, right, and you're doing it very, very efficiently, you know, then most of the time it's going to, it's going to work out, right? And, and, and I do think there's nothing to be ashamed of with profit either. Let me just make that point too. I think that's sometimes... That's probably something that I've thought about over those years, you know, is, um, is it a contradiction, you know, to <laughs> profess to be on this noble path yet um, to be uh, angling for profit. Um, but to me, there's nothing uh, to be ashamed about that. I think, I think profit is, is, is um, can be um, a sign of healthy progress, in fact, right? I mean, obviously, there, there is such a thing as excess profit. So I think, and there's, um, you know, so because it comes down to how is it generated? Right. What, you know, the, because I think the, the means do have to, you know, the how is very important, um, ultimately, because if the how is not uh, proper and correct, then it's not going to be sustainable, you know, is my way of thinking. Uh, so um, because I think the goal is not just profit in one quarter, it's it's sustainable profit over time. Yeah, so I think that's the discussion, you know, again, yeah, so you can, yeah, so now with ESG, it's just really broadened the discussion. Like I say, you can really talk about holistically, what are all the outputs, some of which are measurable, some of which may not be, 
what are all those inputs and um, the, you know, the ratio between those. What, what I observed with companies, especially in Europe, I don't know if this is the rest of the world also true, is that um, like competition and the urge for certain individuals to want to pursue their own career yeah, is hindering uh, collaboration. So people start mm. fighting each other and yeah. maybe going in, in different directions. And um, mm. what, what would put your be your advice to uh, when you find such a group of people uh, to align them or at least mm. to, to minimize the impact of these, these uh, what we call organizational theater or organizational oh, yeah. games. No, absolutely. Look, Vanna, I think that's, um, you've touched on a huge thing. I think that's so important, you know, to kind of, how do we get past this culture of contest, you know, is one way I've heard it framed. Uh, from Michael Carlberg to, you know, more of a culture of collaboration and, and um, mutual uh, support and that sort of thing. And I, I think there's, um, I think that's something that we, that is now the discussion. That's, that's actually what we have to really talk about is um, because I really believe that culture of contest is very short-sighted. And you might get a short burst of, of, uh, of you know, accomplishment, but uh, I just am not convinced that that's, that it lasts very long. It's very... Um, or another way to think of it is, um, you know, conflict is another discussion, you know, is conflict good or bad? And, um, and there, uh, for me, the, the point is to, to be a little more nuanced, you know, let's make a distinction between constructive conflict and destructive conflict. Um, and some of those behaviors you just mentioned, Banner, I find are very toxic in an organization, right? I mean, if you have this sort of egocentric sort of, it's all about me and that sort of thing, you know, it becomes very obvious and um, and very destructive, you know, and it actually really, really destroys the effectiveness of a group of human beings, you know, to accomplish something very, very effectively. And uh, pretty soon people leave that sort of place and um, and the mission fails, right? So um, uh, versus the opposite, right? Of Again, if you create an atmosphere where everyone feels valued and, and, uh, and dignified and, and you have this sense of higher purpose uh, to, to the group, and that uh, that everyone's got a you know a place uh, to play and and that sort of thing. Then um, I think again that magic sort of happens and and the group becomes much greater than the sum of its parts. Um, I think that I think that's something that we just have to be a lot more um, deliberate about. And because I, I, I do believe that's the reality. That's definitely my experience. There there was a comment from Simon Sinek recently that I saw, which was, I thought was very interesting around that of of looking at teams and. Uh, you you can have two dimensions on on uh, you know one dimension is um, you know performance and and aptitude or you know how skilled uh, an individual is, and then the other side is um, you know sort of how collaborative they are and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, you know clearly, you know when you're assembling a team, what you find is uh, when you look at different examples, you know Navy SEALs or uh, or whatever teams, you find that the teams that are the most effective are teams where there's a feeling of safety is probably the most important attribute. Um, and that, and that, 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 that they all, you know, that everybody feels like they've got their back. There's a team spirit is there. Those teams are going to outperform a, 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 a team of selfish, you know, egotistical folks um, every time, you know? And, uh, and so, you know, I, I think that's just a reality. And so maybe one is intellectually, you know, making the case for that, um, that at the highest levels of organization, people have to buy into that because I think it is a fact. Um, and then it's just nurturing that kind of culture, you know, in, in the organization. Mark, it's really lovely to hear you speak. Um, really, I think you can always have a whole series to yourself <laughs> um, and I'll be attending every one of them. <laughs> um, I'm curious about, you know, if you've ever experienced work where it hasn't aligned to your values and kind of how you how you uncovered that, how you kind of recognized it, how long it maybe took and mm. maybe what you did to then realign back to your values. You know, well, I suppose part of it was probably self-selective from the beginning. You know, when I when I um, when I finished graduate school, um, you know, I was fortunate to have a couple of different choices and and that was part of my criteria, you know, to sign up for the industry was, you know, I really consciously thought to myself, you know, I've got to believe in in what this company is trying to achieve. And if I can't do that, then I don't want to be part of it, you know. And so it's probably 
you know, that probably has protected me um, was having that filter at the very beginning. And, you know, obviously once you're in it, you're, you know, there's, you're always going to be confronted with different situations where, um, where it's, you know, suboptimal and you, you feel like there's this sort of, again, some of those, uh, what Vanna just mentioned, you know, that definitely felt that, um, they encountered that in, in the past. And so, but there, I think it's more about trying to improve it. And um, again, this kind of find some allies and, and in some ways try to, uh, can you, you know, can we, can you be part of improving uh, the situation and, and the circumstance and be a, be a positive leaven sort of <laughs> in the, in the, you know, um, yeah, in, in the mix there. And, uh, and up until now, I've, I've fortunately not been in a situation where it's so bad that, um, that I feel like I'd rather leave than, than keep trying, you know, I've never left an organization for that reason. You know, it's been more just because of different circumstances, whatever, but, um, but, but I do think that's perfectly valid, you know, and, and that's one way of, of bringing about change. Sometimes the best way to bring about change is uh, to vote with your feet. And, uh, you know, this organization may not be worth saving. It's so bad. It's better to leave and join something that's better. And, um, you know, I think that's part of the natural process here as well, the Darwinian process of, of you know, at an organizational level, right, of finding um, human systems that are much more effective at accomplishing our this noble mission that we're on. You know. I have a question about because you're working in an organization which is purely corporate and now you work in an organization which has more of a cooperative mindset. And I wonder if there's a different way in which interactions happen because of the structure, because very often people come to BBF saying, what is the ideal governance structure to create a values driven organization? Yeah. Uh, is this something that came to mind that has a difference between these? Yeah, that would be a whole other series, I think, is to explore that. Part um, two, right? Well, <laughs> yeah, part two. That may be part two. Yeah, I mean, I think on one level, there's no difference because it's, you know, it's a group of human beings trying to accomplish something. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, but then maybe on a, on a yeah, on, on other levels, there there is huge difference. Um, you know, with the cooperative, it's that, you know, it's it's a fascinating economic arrangement because it's, the supplier is the owner of the business, you know, and uh, and so that it does create some very interesting dynamics and stuff. But um, yeah, I, I I think that's that should be a continuing conversation. You know, is um, what are the optimal um, organizational structures and things to accomplish things? You know, we could probably talk about in really large organizations. Um, you know, is that you know I remember Arthur Dahl asked me one time, can an organization be too large? <laughs> And that's a question that stuck with me all this time as well. So I don't have an answer to that yet. But um. uh, the final question that we have for everyone is, what is your role, your part, your responsibility as an individual in an organization to promote a meaningful workplace? We talk a lot about how it comes from the executive side, the manager side, but what's the role of the individual um, in, in depending on um, where you are in the organization, but as a, in a general sense, what's the role of, of people who are working, maybe not on the executive side or leadership? I think in any position one is in an organization, you can make work more meaningful for someone else, which is something that does not depend on position, up or down, you, you, you can congratulate colleagues on, on the way they are doing things, reminding them of the benefit that they are creating for society. So I, I think one can create more meaning for others and that makes my own job more meaningful. I, I discovered that um, I retired from the management job, uh, being a direct manager to someone uh, three years ago and it was a good step to step down yeah um, and uh, I found out that my new role is to reduce when I see the pressure on people so when I see that someone is under a lot of pressure I say okay I have two or three hours can I help you with something and, and whatever it is, even if you, if you organize a meeting or help him with some paper or help her with preparing a workshop, um, usually this helps. And, and even the question, can I help you with something, uh, leads for, for the individual to a rethinking of, of what they're doing. And, and this, in most cases, reduces the pressure a bit.
And, and that goes for the idea of community building. How do you build a community? You first create a core group. It's only two, three people, no matter what level of the organization. And this core group <clears throat> usually encourages one another. And then as a result, more people join. And then you have a group. And then you have a movement. So uh, <clears throat> it, it really does not depend on which part of the uh, organization one is situated. All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And we appreciate your input. And if you have uh, suggestions for 52 minutes series, let us know.